Support for the Alan L. Edwards Psychology Lecture Series is provided by the University of Washington Alumni Association. The Science of Psychology in the Real World Made possible through an endowment from noted University of Washington professor Alan Edwards, whose half-century of research, teaching, and writing transformed psychological research. Tonight, part one of Eco-Psychology, Reinventing the Human-Nature Relationship in the Digital Age, featuring University of Washington professor Peter Kahn. Good evening. I'm Scott Murray, the Associate Chair for Research of the Psychology Department. And I have the distinct honor of welcoming you to the eighth annual Edwards Public Lecture Series. I am pleased that you could join the psychology department as we learn more about the science of psychology in the real world. Before introducing this evening's lectures, I'd like to make a few comments about how this series came about. This annual lecture series is the result of the generous support of Professor Alan L. Edwards, who made a substantial gift to establish an endowment that ensures that this series can take place. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the University of Washington Department of Psychology for half a century, from his arrival in 1944 as an associate professor until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who is credited with changing the way modern psychological research is carried out by introducing modern statistical techniques to the field. His statistics books were long-standing gold standards. The Edwards family contribution to the psychology department is an example of what can be accomplished with support from members of the community, and we thank the Edwards family for their generous support. Now, as a psychologist, as a scientist, I fundamentally believe that the questions I address in my, my own research are both interesting and, and important. However, I and many other scientists often grapple with the real world, real world significance of what we do in the laboratory. How do my research findings impact the day-to-day -day lives of, our, of people in our community? This year, our public lecture series highlights faculty in our department, as well as their distinguished guests, who have research programs that clearly impact our day-to-day -day lives. They really demonstrate the impact of the science of psychology in the real world. Tonight, we are fortunate to feature two of the world's leaders in environmental research. They have thought deeply about the relationship between human psychology and nature, particularly within the context of a rapidly changing digital world. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. Peter Kahn, professor of psychology at the University of Washington. Dr. Peter Kahn directs the Human Interaction with Nature and Technological Systems Laboratory here at the University of Washington. He brings forward a unique integration of us as beings that are deeply connected to nature and at the same time increasingly technological and scientific. One of the questions Peter has sought to answer in the lab is whether interacting with technologies that mimic nature can provide the same psychological benefits as interacting with actual nature. And he'll talk about this topic uh, in this evening's lecture. It's part of what he and Scott Sampson are calling an eco-psychology for the digital age. Peter received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Over the last 10 years, his research has been funded by the National Science Foundation. His research publications have appeared in such journals as Child Development, Developmental Psychology, Journal of Environmental Psychology, Journal of System Software, and Human Computer Interaction. His most recent books include Eco-Psychology, Science, Totems, and the Technological Species, and the recently published book entitled The Rediscovery of the Wild. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Kahn. It's so good to see you. It's so many of you. Uh, <laughs> Human interaction with nature and technological systems. Doesn't that, doesn't that sound really tech techy? And you know what I would really like to be doing? I wish there was a campfire and we were just around the campfire and just talking. That's what I would love to be doing. And I think many of you are here because you would like to be doing that too. Uh, we share, I think, my guess is that we share something very deep and it's the love of nature. My guess is that we share a joy of being in nature and it's, it's bringing us all together as a community, and there's even some very young ones I heard somewhere. It's lovely. I'd like to invite you to, uh, to take a moment. I mean, we're, we're coming from so many, you know, think about our days and how different all our days are, but we, we're coming together as a community. 
with this love of, of nature and take a moment, let's use our memories to think of a time that you found meaningful, powerful, or just lovely in nature. And where were you? And what, what were you doing? Can you get yourself back in that space? Maybe it helps if you close your eyes. Oh. Were there other people with you? And how, how did you feel? Perhaps it was peaceful, restful, maybe invigorating, maybe focused, maybe a little fearful, maybe a lot fearful, or maybe some combination. I mean, if you think about the campfire analogy, it's, how many of you have been around a campfire? All right, so you know. And you're sitting around, what happens? There's talking, conversation, maybe food. The fire starts dying down. The, the stars come, start emerging. Arizona Kohawk wrote that beautiful book, Between the Embers and the Stars. Isn't that lovely? And that's us just um, settling in. And it's peaceful, and at the same time, it's awe-inspiring. How unusual to be able to get those two feelings united together. In your memories, uh, when, when you put yourself back in that spot, how many of you had an animal? Uh, raise your hand. In, an encounter with an animal is one of those experiences. Some of you. How many of you, how many, was there a wild animal? A lot. Uh, that's, that's so powerful, isn't it? Think about, in, I mean, I, I've had encounters where, like with a bear, and you see the bear, the bear sees you. It happens sometimes just for an instant where the eyes meet, and it's electric. It's beautiful. And that short moment can stay with us for a lifetime. How many of you have dogs? Oh, okay, that's nature. That's human nature interaction. That's deep, it's beautiful. It, many, many interactions in the course of the day. Of course, the eyes meet. You know how the dogs work with their eyes, many of them, so effectively. <laughs> they cajole more treats. Uh, and, they, and sometimes you're walking with a dog, and then you pay as much attention to the dogs who's paying attention to nature because their senses are so acute, and they're giving access to things that you can't see. Did anyone think of a, being on a beach? Oh, yeah. <laughs> being in Seattle, it's a really lovely memory. I mean, and it's very powerful, of course, walking on a beach and swimming, being with friends, family, children, walking you know, hand in hand. How many just walking in the woods? Lot. How many? How, how many were in the city in somewhere like walking Green Lake? Yes, Green Lake's beautiful. Burke Gilman. So, how many of you have walked the Burke Gilman? All right. So, it wasn't one of the memories that you you chose to draw on, but but lovely. So, these experiences in nature you're thinking about right now. Hold on to them this evening. And we'll be drawing on these experiences to help vision a future. And I think it's a future we want to live in. I think that's why you're here. I think it's a future that we want our children to live in. And of course, their children. And it's part of sustainability. So our direction for this evening will be as follows. I'll provide very briefly some of the evidence to support the idea that our interaction with nature benefits us physically and psychologically. I think all of you know this to be true. You can think of me coming here to tell you that what you know is verified by scientific evidence. Is that comforting? <laughs> I'll suggest that we're not only a natural species, but we're a technological species. And then I'll spend some time on a question that I've taken up in some of my research here at the University of Washington, and that is, what are the psychological effects of interacting with technological substitutes of nature? What I call technological nature, and can we create effective technological substitutes of nature. And I'll offer then a psychological answer to why we don't understand why we need more nature and, and also more wild nature in our lives. And I suspect you'll 
this, I suspect you'll agree with me, judging that the memories you drew on when you were walking, you were not walking on the Burke Gilman, on the, you were, I think you were walking a little more on the wild side, and I would, I'll want to come back to that, that idea toward the end of my talk. I'll also offer a psychological answer to why we don't understand why we need more nature and more wild nature in our lives, and I'll suggest, it, I'll suggest it's perhaps one of the largest psychological problems of our lifetime. It's a very strong claim, and it's I'm perhaps with my bias towards nature, but I'll see if I can make good on it and uh, welcome questions on that later. And finally, I'll offer a new vision for psychology. It's what uh, my colleagues and I are calling an eco-psychology, an eco-psychology that embraces not simply nature, but science and technology. And then we'll have time for questions, and I look forward to the, the dialogue very much with you. So on the science part, it, there's, there's just a large body of, of, of scientific evidence from, very, uh, from a lot of different disciplines. It's not just one discipline that focuses on this, that shows this to be true, that direct experiences with nature have beneficial effects on us physically, cognitively, emotionally, in terms of human health. Think of us, you know, think of a study that Roger Ulrich did in 1984. Some of you may know it. It was published in Science, uh, in the journal Science. And he looked at hospital patients who were, uh, ended up in one of two rooms after gallbladder surgery. And one, one room looked at um, to a, a beautiful nature setting, and another room looked down to a brick wall. And then he looked, out, looked at outcomes. And he found that patients who had the nature view, they, they did better. They, they, in terms of self-report, in terms of how they were doing, better self-report, better nurses' report. They needed less pain medication. And of course, on the critical issue, they were out of the hospital sooner. So, I mean, this is, this is practical knowledge. I mean, if, it, if, if you're in the unfortunate situation to be in a hospital, keep this finding in mind. It matters. It matters what you are looking at and whether it's nature or not. Other studies have shown that looking out onto nature reduces sickness of prisoners in prisons. Studies have shown that looking on a fish aquarium calms patients before surgery. Do any of you remember Aquariums used to be in dental offices. Okay, some of you are saying, I remember that. And, 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 and I don't think it's an accident. I think there's something very calming. Even, even with fish in captivity, there's something calming about being able to connect in that way. Other studies have shown that interactions with animals such as dogs, cats, birds, dolphins, and even small turtles, interactions with these animals increase physiological health, social competence, and learning opportunities for children, the elderly, and the general population. I mean, for all of us. So these interactions help us live longer and more healthy. The Dean of Public Health here at the University of Washington, Howard Frumpkin, wrote a chapter for my recent co-edited book uh, with my collaborator, Patricia Hasbach, on eco-psychology. It's a book I'll, uh, I'll highlight later. And in his chapter, Howard Frumpkin reviews hundreds of these scientific studies. And from his reading of the evidence, he's convinced that there's ample reason to move forward on a global level based on the assumption that interaction with nature is essential for a physical and psychological well-being. So I would like to suggest for us, let's, let's move forward with that assumption. Let's move forward with it tonight, and let's move forward with it in our lives. I think it's an assumption that's well warranted. But as we move forward with it, I would like us to be aware of two world trends that I think are radically restructuring human existence. And these are two trends that, when I, these captivate me. If you ask, what, what am I focused on? I just think the, these, are the, these are the two that are structuring a lot of my thinking and a lot of my work. One is there's the degradation, if not destruction, of nature. It's happening very quickly. From an evolutionary standpoint, over hundreds of thousands of years, and you look what we're doing and look at how fast we're destroying nature. We're just, and if you understand then that we're destroying the very nature that we depend upon physically and psychologically for our well-being, that's a huge, huge restructuring of human life. The second large trend is that th we're increasing the, in our technology, its sophistication and its pervasiveness, and it's increasing not in a linear fashion, but it's increasing exponentially. Now, we've always been a, a technological species. You know, if you go back 50,000 years, 
we're using bows and arrows, more, um, you know, digging sticks, we're making fires like this. Talk about how long, you were talking about the campfire and how powerful that is. Think how long that goes back in revolutionary history. The technology is rudimentary, very simple. And then starting maybe 5, 000, uh, 50,000 years ago, 30,000, 20,000, as we move into the Neolithic period and then into agriculture, the technology gets increasingly uh, sophisticated, but slowly still, but it's still growing. And then it starts accelerating more and more. And Ray Kurzweil in his uh, writing, I think argues effectively that what we're experiencing is exponential technological growth. Now, you know about exponential curves, right? I mean, take a functions, take a dollar and double it every day. After a week, we're doing, you know, okay, we got $64. It's, it's nice, but it's not a lot to shout about. But after a month, we have over a billion dollars from a week to a month. Same function, exponential growth. And what Ray Kurzweil and others argue is that in terms of technology, the speed and change of technolo technology today, we're at the knee of that exponential curve where it's just exploding. And that's us right now. And so when I'm looking at these two world trends that are radically restructuring human existence, one's the degradation of nature and the, at very fast rate, and the other is the explosion of technology. So in my research program, I've been focusing at this intersection of these two world trends. And to get traction on, on, on this issue, I've been asking about technologies that in some way will seek to mediate, simulate, or augment the natural world. For example, many of us grew up watching television or movies on nature, Animal Kingdom, Animal Planet, the Discovery Channel. We could ask the question, how does, how, how is it? How, does, how well does it connect us to nature? And what are the strengths of that? And what are the limitations compared to, right? Compared to actual nature, being in nature. I've experienced avalanches on Denali when I've been climbing there. And uh, that's a very physical experience. I've also been at the IMAX theater for the Mount Everest show, and this was a still shot of that. And that's a phenomenal picture. With, uh, that's not a good place to be if, <laughs> you know, if it was real, real. I mean, it's real digital, it's real, this is real, but it's not embodied, it's not 3D, it's, we're not out in nature. And so there's a difference. Video games now engage children with animal life. So many of you were thinking, have experience with the dogs and have dogs currently, but what about videos and virtual dogs? Zoos themselves are bringing technology such as webcams into their exhibits. We could be watching a webcam of, of live animals right now. Robot pets have been selling well. And robot animals are going to be part of our future. There's no doubt about that. And I'll come back to this uh, shortly and show you a few video clips of kids interacting with a robot dog. You might be aware of this, uh, or some version of this DVD fireplace. Uh, especially in Seattle, it's not so satisfying. It's cold, you know, you come in from the rain and you try to, <laughs> it doesn't work so well. Uh, but it's satisfying in other ways, technological nature. So does it matter, in terms of the future well-being of our species, does it matter that we're replacing actual nature with technological nature? So over the last 10 years, my colleagues and students and I have been investigating children's and adults' experiences of different forms of cutting edge technological nature. And we've been working with plasma display, windows of nature, telegarden, robot dog, and humanoid robot. And I'd like to uh, talk out uh, a couple of them in a, with a little bit of specificity and, and, uh, and, and share what we've been finding. So here's one of our early studies with uh, the plasma display nature window. And in the study, we created three different office conditions. The first was a normal office at the University of Washington here. And it was, that was a new, if you know the university, it's Mary Gates Hall. It was, uh, it was looking out, an office looking out over the fountain. And very appreciative of Dean Mike Eisenberg, who was dean at the time, who let us have that prime real estate office for an entire year as we were trying to figure out how to do this study. We, what circled on the left, Small photo is the HDTV, cam HDTV camera that we borrowed from the university, the best quality at the time. We're very appreciative. This is plugs for all the sponsors of this research, right? Thank you to the university for loaning us this camera. We put it on the roof. Uh, right below that camera is the office we were in. So then the large photo is the, the, the photo of the office. What you're looking at on the screen, that's the large plasma screen. It's the photo of what you would see out that window. If you took that display away, that's the window. 
So we've got one condition with the nature, and it's a real-time view of nature, right? It's not a recording. It's not like that DVD of the fireplace that's just repeating. This is what's actually happening, but it's on technological nature window. So one condition was that. The other condition was with the actual window. We just took, took that screen away, and that's the actual window. And the third condition is we closed it all off and then pulled the blinds over and basically made it into an inside office. So we had 90 adult participants, 30 in each of three conditions. We measured their physiological re recovery from low-level stress. We stressed them and looked at recovery stress. We did that multiple times. We also conducted a second-by-second -second coding of what people did with their eyes. You can see the camera poking out from the, the screen there. So that's capturing their eye gaze. And we also had that camera uh, synchronized with the physiological data recording. So I'll come back to the finding there shortly. So what did we find? Well, the uh, first thing is that in terms of physiological recovery from low-level stress, we found that there was more rapid heart rate recovery in the glass window condition compared to the blank wall condition. In other words, the glass window was more restorative than the blank wall, and it's a neat finding. It builds a little bit on that, uh, uh, you know, the Ulrich study that I was talking about and published in Science, the hospital study, that is actual nature uh, compared to no nature. And then uh, we looked at the key question, in a sense, which is, well, what happens with the plasma screen? And what we found was there was no difference, no difference in heart rate recovery between the plasma window condition and the blank wall condition, which surprised us in some ways. If anything, our expectation was, you know, maybe it would be in between. It seems better than nothing, but not as good as the real thing. But on this measure, it's only one measure, so I don't want to overstate it, but on this measure, no difference. We also uh, found that participants look just as often at the plasma window compared to the glass window. So what they're doing with their eyes, they're looking just as often, but when they look, they don't stay there as long. And then finally, we found that when participants spent more time looking at the glass window, their heart rate tended to decrease more rapidly, and that was not the case with the plasma window. In other words, when we control for, in a sense, when we're controlling for eyeballs on stimuli, looking at the glass window was more restorative than looking at the plasma window. So from this initial study, the plasma window didn't come out so great. But in a in second investigation, we conducted a field study where we installed these plasma windows in windowless offices, and this is the key. They're installed in offices of faculty and staff here at the university where they did not have windows. On the left-hand photo is the uh, faculty member in her inside office, and on the right-hand side is a, uh, a student surface. Uh, it's a very large student service office, and that's why that plasma display is looking so small. It's actually quite a large room. And based on assessments over a 16-week period, results showed that faculty and staff reported an increase in their physiological, uh, in their psychological well-being, an increase in their cognitive functioning, an increase in their connection to the natural world, and an increase in their social connection to UW. I mean, one, at one point it was like graduation time, and like the person's able to look out not only onto the fountain, but seeing all the happy people walking by. What a joyful occasion. To, and she was talking about how wonderful it is to be part of the university. Well, yeah, it is. But how can you get that connection if you don't have a window. And this is a window then that was providing both the nature access and, and the social, human access. Four weeks after the plasma, window was, was plasma windows were taken out of their offices, everyone said they would like to have had it back in their office. Notice what they're comparing it to, though. They're comparing it to having no window. And how, how many of you have worked in an inside office with no window. This, oh my goodness, no, don't tell me that. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> Gee. Okay, well, how many of you like that? One, two, I'm counting two. You know, be honest, I'm open here. Three, all right, not too many. I would, most of you I think would agree with me, it's pretty horrible. Uh, and especially in Seattle, especially in the winter time, you co uh, many people are going into work. It's dark. They go into their inside office, and they leave, and it's dark. No connection at all. And that's day in and day out. Very hard. There are laws in other countries that don't uh, prevent, that don't allow for that. Well, 
the basic pattern we're finding then is that when we can, if you take both of these studies together, I think this is in a sense the takeaway message from these two studies, and we see, we'll see this replicated in other studies, is that when we compare technological nature to no nature, then the technological nature can look pretty good. And if we compare technological to nature, the, the psychological ramifications of interacting with technological nature compared to actual nature, it doesn't come out as good. We'll see this pattern emerge again. Here's another study. I won't say much about it. Uh, think of this, you know, just start to get hitting your head around different ways the future is going to unfold. Here's a telegarden. This installation was created in part by Ken Goldberg at UC Berkeley. It was an actual garden in Austria that allowed remote gardeners to plant and tend seeds by controlling a robotic arm through a web-based interface. I mean, you've heard of telesurgery, telerobotic surgery. You've heard of the telephone, right? I mean, telepresence. They're androids that are tele-operated androids. This is a telegarden. This is another way of interacting. And we looked at the, the chat data from this. And in our analysis of how people were talking about gardening, it would appear that a telegarden can, this might not surprise you, can provide, well, it can provide some of the experiences of gardening. Maybe that's the part that's surprising. It didn't provide a lot, but it provided some. But if you think of this just as an early instantiation of technological nature and think of how fast technology is moving, it's pretty provocative. I said I'd come back to robot dogs. So here's uh, a video clip I'd like to just show you. This first one is very quick. Uh, for those of you who have dogs or who were thinking of your canine companions earlier, think about kids coming of age with these type of uh, dogs. I think it is a robot dog. The, you know, think if it was a biological dog and you don't know it, it's like a nice dog, <laughs> right? Uh, but you're keeping your distance and then all of a sudden it moves quickly to you and you startle, you know, very quickly, faster than probably conscious cognition is really kicking in, you move away. I'll just show it again since it's so quick. I think it is a robot dog. Now in this second video clip, notice this is about a minute long, notice how this boy offers verbal directives to Ibo, like get the ball, Ibo. And it would seem that the child believes that Ibo is the sort of entity that can understand directives and respond accordingly. And again, this is actual data from one of our studies. some questions about Ivo? Oh, it down. It hit <laughs> Hey Noah, if you decide that you don't like Ivo anymore, is it okay to throw Ivo in the garbage? No. No? Why? I know. You know, one, one question we were asking with this form of technological nature is whether robot pets can substitute for biologically live pets. And in some ways, our data suggests yes. And in the video clips we just saw, we're seeing some behaviors that look somewhat like human-dog-like interactions, like the startle response or playing fetch with the dog. So we've done other studies comparing people interacting with Ibo compared to a biological dog and of how robot dogs can potentially benefit children with autism. All of these studies you can pull off of my website if you're interested in the science behind it. I welcome that. And also I pulled all of these studies together in a 2011 book titled Technological Nature Adaptation and the Future of Human Life. I have a copy afterwards if you want to just uh, look at it. There's a long-standing puzzle 
that I think you're aware of, and the, uh, type, uh, it can be framed in this way, are humans a part of nature or a part, a part from nature or a part of nature? And my take on the question is that we're both. And this evening so far, I've been focusing on nature as a part from humans. I've cast things as human nature interaction, but I'd like now to highlight that humans are nature too, and that human-human interaction is profoundly natural activity. But technologies are moving into that realm as well, because in the future we'll increasingly be interacting with personified computational systems. We already are. We're experiencing simple forms like, um, I mean, think about talking GPS systems. Think about talking with Siri on, on Apple's uh, iPhone. But perhaps the most classic form of personified computation is the humanoid robot. So my lab is interested in this question of whether we might form social and moral relationships with humanoid robots, and if so, what it looks like. And my lab's research here is in collaboration with one of the leading robotics labs of the world, ATR, in Japan, and our collaborators are Takuyuki Kanda and Hiroshi Ishiguro, and the robot we've been using is their robot, and it's named Robovi. And what I'd like to do is to show you a, a long video, and then just move on. This is a think piece. And the idea is to use the video as another way to think about future interactions with technological nature, technological human nature, and what that might look like. So this video clip is from our study where we engaged 90 children and adolescents with RoboV in a 15-minute interaction. Then we interviewed each participant for 50 minutes afterwards to try to understand their social and moral ideas about RoboV. And this video starts after the 15-year-old uh, adolescent had been interacting with RoboV for about 10 minutes. And this is uh, Katie Stanton doing the interviewing or the experimenter. I'd like to play a game with you. In this game, we'll take turns finding an object in the room and giving each other clues about the object without actually saying what it is. Okay. That's right. So the game's called I Spy. Right. So Roby and I'll go first, and uh, I'll give clues, and I'll have Roby guess. Okay. So Katie and Robovi play the game together, and now it's the uh, adolescent's turn to play. And this is, I think, about two and a half minutes. All right, well, this time, uh, Robovi is going to give you clues, and you can guess. Sure. Go ahead. OK. I think I found something. Here's the first clue. This object weighs less than a pound. Uh, is it the, uh, the shirt draped over the chair? Not quite. Try again. Next clue. This object is smaller than a football. Um, is it the, uh, this? The, the, uh, what do you call them, uh? The coaster? Coaster. <laughs> the coasters. The coaster? Good, yes. But that's not the object I'm thinking of. Here's another clue. The object is white, and it has a handle. White, it has a handle. Um, ah, is it a, a, one of the teacups, or the cups? Good job. You got it right. That was a good game. Good. I had some. Will you give me a hug? Certainly. Thank you. Now it's your turn to play the game. You can give me some clues, and I'll try to guess the object you are thinking of. All right. Um, first clue. This object is green. Let's go. Into the closet. No, 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 no,
Uh, Reese, I don't know what uh, researchers are interesting people. <laughs> uh, the first question we asked the participant when we interviewed them was in our 50 minute interview was, do you think it's all right or not all right to put Robovi in the closet? And then we asked why. So let me just ask all of you, raise your hand if you thought it was not all right to put Robovi in the closet. Uh, okay, you're uh, my, I just, did a quick processing of all the numbers here, and it's identical to the numbers that we found. <laughs> it was surprisingly close, actually. 54% of the kids we interviewed said it was not all right, and it was very close, actually, to what I saw with hands. And usually they provided moral reasons, such as it wasn't fair to Robovi, and it was, it was uh, causing Robovi psychological harm. <laughs> now, we were controlling Robovi from behind the scenes but the participants didn't know that, and likely many of you didn't know that. But having said that, I think it's important to realize when I'm going back to Kurzweil's idea of exponential techno technological growth that this is an autonomous robot. It has a lot of autonomous capabilities. I saw it lead children around the Osaka Science Center in Japan and talk about the exhibits and interact in some minimal ways with the children, all autonomously. So the future is being created. In fact, uh, in, I think in the audience, uh, tonight is one of the creators of this robot, Takuki Kanda. I thought, Takuki, could you uh, stand and let everyone uh, see who you are? <laughs> <laughs> so, he's, uh, you know, he's my friend, he's my collaborator. Uh, he's quite amazing creating something like that. He's here just for this week. We're starting a new series of experiments, and uh, it's just wonderful to uh, have him as a collaborator and friend. That's him, that's the hugging. Humanoid robots, the one big idea I wanna highlight, and I think Takeyuki would agree with me, is that humanoid robots are going to be engaging us socially and probably in some respects morally. So humanoid robots as a form of technological nature will become part of our lives, and these robots may become caretaking assistants for the elderly or academic tutors for our children, or medical assistants, or daycare assistants, or psychological counselors and therapists. They may become bankers that replace ATMs or maids in our homes. These robots may become our friends. But what if in the process, the general pattern that my lab has been documenting continues to unfold? Remember the pattern, when we compare technological nature to no nature, technological nature looks good. But when we compare technological nature to actual nature, technological nature comes up short. Well, as we create and interact with personified technologies, we don't want to lose, we don't want to lose the depth and intimacy of human-human interaction no more than we want to lose the depth and intimacy of human-nature interaction. Now, some people, some people re respond to the position I'm, I, I just put forward, and they say, what's the big deal? And they, I mean, they, they say things like, Peter, just relax, you know, you're too worried about things. And in their counter position, they often make three claims. They say, one, we'll adapt, two, is adaptation is how we evolved, and three, is adaptation is good for us. And I think the first claim is true, we will adapt. It's that or we'll go extinct, and I don't think that will happen. The second claim is also true, adaptation is part of evolutionary heritage, but I don't think the third claim is always true. We can adapt and suffer physically and psychologically. If you take a wild leopard and put it in a cage, if it doesn't die, it will adapt and it will change its behavior. And it might start pacing back and forth, and it might go half crazy. Let's imagine all of us were put in prison for the rest of our lives. If we don't die straight out, and most of us won't, we would adapt, right? We might get, I don't know, fatter from lack of exercise. We might get violent. 
with a lot of rage. Another way we might deal with it is we might just totally shut down, go almost catatonic. We might need drugs for depression. We might be hardly aware that that's happening to us. So just because we'll adapt to technological nature doesn't by itself mean it's good for us. But I don't think we'll have an easy time knowing it's not good for us, and I'd like to suggest why. And to set up this idea, I'd like to draw on one of my early studies from the 1990s, where a colleague and I interviewed 72 economically impoverished inner-city African-American children in Houston, Texas, about their environmental views and values. And we found that roughly two-thirds of the children understood about air pollution and water pollution in general, but they didn't think Houston had this problem, which was amazing, because Houston was, you know, I think at the time, it was the most polluted city in the United States. So how could kids growing up in such a polluted city not be aware of it, but they could tell you what pollution is? And one possible answer is that to understand about the idea of pollution, one needs to compare existing polluted states to those that are less polluted. And if one's only experience is with a certain amount of pollution, that amount of becomes not pollution, but the norm or baseline against which more polluted states are measured. Now, I want to extend this interpretation in two ways. And the first, I think, is that the psychological phenomenon which appeared in the Houston children reflects the same phenomenon that can occur any time individuals lack an experiential comparison by which to judge the health and integrity of nature. And here's, here's a scenario that's close to my heart, and uh, I've seen it played out many times uh, in Northern California. I've been part of a community there for many years, 40 years. There were large tracts of land, maybe 10,000 acre tracts. I've seen them logged, subdivided into smaller sections. So take, take like a 670 acre uh, parcel. Uh, and uh, people buy it from more urban areas. And then, uh, and it's already been logged many times, but there's still a lot of good timber there. They look at the timber and they say, huh, you know, I think there's a way to um, take some trees. Uh, they're good people. They, they might even be members of the Sierra Club, right? Uh, uh, and, and they say, well, I think there's ways to do some logging in a, in a, in a responsible way, and they do. And, and, they, and if I'm talking to them, and they might see something in my eye, and they, and, you know, they say, well, you know, you, you, you use, you, you're in a wood house. We all need trees, so we, have, we need lumber. And so they log. Then they look at all the 670 acres and say, well, that's a lot of land. We don't need that much. And so they subdivide, and now you've got 160s. They keep the nicest 160. They sell the other 160s. People from more urban areas come in. They buy it. They're judging the health and integrity of the land based on where they're coming from, a more urban area. They look at, now it's just been logged a couple, a couple years ago, and they say, huh, I think there's some ways to, you know, they have land payments to make. It's not easy. You know, money is hard. And, and so they, they say, I think I need to, you know, I'm going to log. And I think I can do it responsibly. And I'm a good person. And they are good people. It's not an issue of good people. It's the issue of what's their baseline. What are they comparing it to? And they go ahead and they log. And then they do the same thing, and, and then they subdivide, and now we've got 40-acre parcels. And now people, and you see where it goes, and the only thing stopping it are, is legislation. It's, the psychology is not stopping it. The land above my cabin, when I was a kid there, it was old growth. And it, I think it's been six, in the course of my life, in six, uh, it's been logged six times. And the, la and the last two loggings, in the last two loggings, I've walked the, I've walked the land and, and I've cried. I mean, I think of it as, you know, walk and weep. I, I don't know what else to do. There's now not, there's nothing, there's nothing larger than 11-inch diameter trees on slopes that are as much as 60 degrees. So there's lots more to say here. We can come back to it later if you'd like. It's connected to what Pauli and others have written about in terms of the shifting baseline with fisheries and what Robert Michael Pyle and others have written about in terms of the extinction of experience. My potential contribution is to highlight the developmental constructivist origins of this problem and its effects across generations because I believe we take the natural environment we encounter during childhood as the norm against which we measure environmental degradation later in our lives. And the crux is that with each ensuing generation, the amount of environmental degradation increases, but each generation takes that amount as the norm, as the non-degraded condition. And I think there's a huge upside. You know, when kids are born, they're not in mentally encumbered by all our mistakes and misdeeds. It's beautiful. It's the innocence of youth, and it's a joy. But it comes with a huge cost, because they don't understand what they're missing, and we don't understand what we're missing. But each gen and this goes back to that large world trend. We continue to degrade nature more very quickly, but each generation is born into that and is not recognizing it. So I've been writing about this problem as the problem of environmental 
generational amnesia. Now, one, um, one last idea, then I'll conclude. I think to a large extent this evening, I've been uh, uh, emphasizing local domestic nature. I think many environmentalists are now emphasizing local domestic nature because I think it's tied to environmental generational amnesia and not having experience with more wild forms. But I think wild nature is equally important as domestic nature. We've got to have more wildness. I think many of the experiences you were drawing on earlier were more wild nature, but we're losing that. We need to bring wildness more forward. And I don't mean just designated wilderness areas, but for some, our integration with something vast, free, self-organizing, and uncharted, at at once innocent and fierce. I'm sorry for not, uh, uh, got really into these ideas. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on key here now. This is, this is my wild flight, right? Okay, and I don't mean just designated wilderness. I'm even writing this out. But for integration with something vast, free, self-organizing, and uncharted, at once innocent and fierce, and at essence so lovely, simple, and satisfying as when miles over a mountain pass, parched with sweat, we kneel streamside and cup our hands and we drink deep with desire. So obviously I've just gone into my memories. Here's a memory of mine. And it's a beautiful memory. I don't want to lose that. The memories that you have, I don't want us to lose those interactions, that capacity for interaction. And of course, the canonical wild exists as well. I also, one other idea I want to highlight is that when I speak of wildness, I'm not only referring to wildness out there, but also within. And does the primal energy of sexuality and aggression tap into wildness within? And what are the healthy expressions of this primal wild energy? And what are the healthy, un, uh, unhealthy expressions? And to what extent are many of our problems today due to the unhealthy expressions of this wildness within? I think uh, the wild and domestic exist along a continuum. So don't think, well, if it's not the canonical bear, it can't be wild. You know, there's the rattlesnake, the hummingbird is wild, there's wildness in Central Park. Anywhere there we are with nature, we can move it more towards the wild. We need to hold that out as a criteria. So uh, I've, uh, with my collaborator Patricia Hasbach, we just came out with a book, uh, uh, it just appeared last month, this, uh, and it's on, titled The Rediscovery of the Wild. And the book considered ways to engage with the wild, protect it, and recover it for our psychological and physical well-being and to flourish as a species. And I also brought a copy of this if you'd like to look at it later. So to uh, sum up, conclude, I think we need, I've been arguing that we need nature for our physical and psychological well-being. We need domestic nature and wild nature, and it's a continuum between them. Technological nature can provide some of the benefits of actual nature, but not all. And let's not have technology shift the baseline lower for what counts as healthy nature and deep nature experiences. And let's not have personified technological systems undermine the natural possibilities for the depth of interaction between people. And finally, uh, environmental generational amnesia helps account for why we don't consciously recognize how much we're hurting by not having more domestic nature and wild nature in our lives. So to uh, conclude with uh, toward building a vision of the future in the 21st century, I think we need an eco-psychology that is, we need a psychology that takes seriously the depth of intimacy with nature and that integrates that within our science and technology. And that's been part of my recent efforts with the publication of my book, Eco-Psychology, Science, Totems, and the Technological Species, with my collaborator, Patricia Hasbach. And in it, we argue that one of the central challenges of our time is to embrace our kinship with a more than human world, our totemic self, and to integrate that kinship with our scientific culture and technological selves. So I'd like to stop here and thank you for your kindness and to open up a dialogue and conversation among us. So uh, welcome questions. And the, we have the microphones here. Uh, thank you. Is this on? Uh, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, given the exponential growth of technology, if you think there might come a time when by external measures like heart rate recovery, um, technological nature actually surpasses uh, true nature, um, and, and, and people might even begin having more wild experiences with technology, and what, that, what the effects of that might be. They, I didn't catch that they might have what sort of experiences? wild experiences More with wild technology experiences. and uh, yeah to to the extent that we connect with nature today yeah 
there, there, there are a couple of questions in there. The, the technologists can always come along and say, well, these are interesting experiments, but you know, if you just gave me another $5 million in a few years, I think I can solve it, right? <laughs> and there's no answer to that. They, uh, and potentially there will be, continue to be improvements so that any measure that we have, the technologists could say, well, I think I've done it. I think one of the things that psychologists can do is to get the right benchmarks out there. What's the criteria that we hold technologists accountable to to be able to solve? And if all we're holding out are things like you know, number of pixels or, or something like that, or resolution, then all these psychological problems can emerge and they, they're not being held accountable to that. If we, hold, if we have a rich account of psychology and the technologist says we can do it, then good, and, then, and at that point it becomes an empirical question, can, can they do it? And at least we're holding them accountable in the right way, or uh, holding us accountable. Because again, I want to highlight, technologists aren't just out there. We, we have to own that we are technological beings. We're technological species. It's not simply corporations that are popping it on us. We love technology, it's deep within us. The issue is it's out of control. We need to find ways to work with it in a different way. So that's, that's you had two questions, but that was one of them. Uh, yeah. Regarding the uh, technological substitutes that you've looked at uh, for nature, have you looked at the uh, uncanny valley phenomenon and uh, tested people's sensitivity to the representations of nature being just a little bit off? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. The, qu the question was about the uncanny valley, which I'm not, I don't know if I can summarize it totally accurately, but it's something like if a representation of, of a robot is not, is if the capabilities of the robot don't match what you think it would look like, then there's this, un, this eerie, uncanny feeling that there's a mismatch. And because there's a mismatch, mismatch there's, there's not, it, it's not working as an interaction. So I think the question is on the technological nature. Do we have, do we have a problem of uncanny valley? I, I, I haven't asked it that way, maybe because I, I think many of the, technologies that we've used, there's been a really good match. If you look at like what uh, with RoboV, uh, and I think this is one of the uh, very successful things that Takiki's been able to do with RoboV, is it clearly looks like a robot. It's not trying to map, you know, look like an Android human presence. And then if you actually look at its capabilities, the capabilities are surprisingly rich, and so you're not getting that mismatch. But it's a, it's a good question, I think something that, that I could give more thought to, so thank you. Hi, I had uh, two questions. Um, for the first one, with the plasma window, was there sound included with the plasma window? And if not, do you think that might have been part of the, um, the difference you saw between the technological nature and the real nature? Uh, the, the, there wasn't sound, and yes, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's a piece of that uh, initial question. I think if we could get sound, uh, if, that, that would help. If we could get, the, I think the largest thing is maybe parallax. We don't, it's a very hard problem to solve when you move the, you know, in a 3D world, everything kind of shifts with it, but on a screen it doesn't. So we don't have, and that's a hard computational problem to solve. It requires these huge computational resources. So that would be something that would need to be solved too. So again, it goes back to, I mean, the world is moving fast technologically, so that you're raising really interesting points. Those are going to get solved. And then the question is, as they get solved, what are the psychological uh, 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 benefits, but also limitations. And part of what I want to uh, come back to is I think part of the problem that we have in the world right now is we have a domination model over nature. We're not coexisting, we're not cohabitating. The importance of interacting with wild nature is the wildness and the self-regulation and the autonomy of the other demands that we work with it rather than control it. And the tension with us interacting with nature is that we control the technology so much. And even as the technology is trying to in, 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 uh, get us to cohabitate, it's trying to get us to cohabitate fundamentally within a controlling model. It's kind of like saying we're gonna, coha we're gonna coexist with the leopard who's in the cage. That's not cohabitation, that's control. And I think we have to be very careful with technology as we think it's replicating this deep experience. Is it or is it actually part of a domination model that's causing the environmental problems today. Okay, thank you. And then the second question was that, um, do you think that our need for nature is inherent or do you think it's more based on just a need for 
some kind of contrast with the more technological life? And if it is contrast-based, do you think that as generations progress and nature becomes less and less a part of our lives, that that effect of nature, that physiological effect, could grow more and more pronounced? Yeah, I think, I think the need for nature goes, is very deep. We're biological beings with an evolutionary history that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. It's deep in the architecture of the, our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. If we think that we can easily, through tech, a culture, culture that's technological, get that out of our lives and flourish, I think it's a mistake. I think it's a huge mistake. If there's one thing I think I would want to leave you with from all of this is that that won't work. If we want to flourish as individuals and as a species, we need deep interaction with nature, and that's why I'm then arguing for an eco-psychology, not just a psychology, not just a psychology of human-human interaction, and not simply a psychology of human-technology interaction, but we need that psychology of human-nature interaction, and then find a way to get all of that working together.